You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 462 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined today by Mr. Seth Miller. How you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. You uh, recovered from Japan? No. Come out of your food coma yet? No. <laughs> Jet lag's a mess. Food's a mess. I mean, I'm... I'm a mess on a good day anyways, but it's been, you know, I'm slowly getting closer. I don't know. I got to go see the doctor about why I can't sleep um, generally. And so doing that on jet lag is going to be super exciting. Mm. Yeah, tons definitely, of definitely some quality test results coming in <laughs> there soon. Uh, and we'll talk about Japan in the bonus topic yeah. for our Patreon subscribers. So stick around for that. Um, but first, first things first. Well, there's hang on. Before we get to first things first, can I ask how you're doing? Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> I got, I got nothing to talk about. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, n- the new Nook Airport in Greenland. Uh, yeah, 2024 is when it's set to open. Late next year. This is has been under construction for a while now. They've been planning it. They've been working on it. Uh, among other things, it will move the main airport for the country uh, into the capital. Um. And the big problem they had basically is that every they there was nowhere to put. Originally, there was nowhere to sort of build the long runway that they needed, mm. or their three thirties to run to Europe and do other long haul bits. And so uh, they built a short runway there, and they built a long one somewhere else. I don't remember the name of the town, but it's inconvenient. It's kind of a dump, and there's nothing there except the runway. Mm. And so I think we've talked about this. I'm planning to be on the inaugural flight from Ikalit to Nuuk next summer and that one's on a q400 so it's easy they can just you know do it yep and uh as part of that though i was looking around at what to do and where to be etc and the uh options were much everybody basically says you want to be in nook but you can't get away from there like you to, mm. to get onward you have to build in the connection time and everything so that was a little bit awkward to make that happen oh so like to go to the other airports that connect the international airports that connect to europe you you got to give yourself extra time to do that yeah i mean it's not much and i actually at one point i think i built us in a milk run of flights i mean it's mm-hmm. only an extra stop but i like if i can get the extra line and it doesn't cost me any time along the way really of course i will yeah um but i also expect that they're going to do a like schedule they're gonna, this is for next june so i anticipate there'll be a schedule chain and someone will decide to make my life better uh in a way that i don't want <laughs> Better in air quotes, right? I mean, but for all literally all definitions of that word, yes, except for dorks like us. Yes, um, but uh, it's nice to see that that's happening. It is a little funny to me that timing wise, they still won't have. You know, they're they're putting a lot of publicity, energy, whatever, into building out the idea of the new flight across to Canada, and it's still and it's going to go to Nook, but it still won't have a new airport ready yet, even when that happens. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And, it, and that's a seasonal route, so when it opens late next year. It'll still won't be there, and it'll have to be for the 2025 season for the Canada flights to truly. Well, I think it's fully connected at the new airport. Yeah, with with the Nook opening like a true international airport, right? Like they're gonna be able to. You think they'll move like the the Copenhagen flight to Nook? Is yes. that the plan? Okay, I would expect so. Okay, because that that leaves out of like a different city. I can't yeah, it leaves out of that other airport, airport now that right? I can't I can't pronounce. So well, forget pronounce. I don't even remember where it is. It's um, uh, SFB SFB, I think. Um, not Sanford. Uh, <laughs> uh, not in Orlando. Uh, uh, SFJ, yeah. you're close. SFJ, I was close. Yes. Um, Connor Slutlusak. Yeah. Which is, it's close to Nook, but not super close to Nook. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I think I'm. I've got a you know a flight book to get between the two, and it's like thirty minutes or something like that. Blocking yeah. time, nothing crazy. Yeah. It's. I mean. The the geography of Greenland is fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah, cool. That's cool. We'll see what we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. Also in new airports, Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. What? 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 I don't know. I got that in our show notes here. Oh. Uh. I t- what? Have you read this article? I didn't put this in the show notes. Yeah, thanks, Foz. <laughs> um. Apparently, someone is suggesting that they want to build a twelve billion dollar airport. Wow, about thirty miles south of downtown, off of I fifteen. Okay, well, that'll be terrible. 
I mean, the, the beauty of the Vegas airport right now is how close it is to everything. Yeah. It still takes yeah. 30 minutes to go everywhere. But. Sure. And I know it's crowded uh, and overwhelmed in a lot of ways. With the same, uh, capacity is somewhere around 65 million passengers, and they're very close to that already. And so yeah. obviously they need to do something to talk about dealing with that. I do ju- I do wonder, and it's a bit in this article here, uh, as I'm skimming it while we're talking, there is some conversation about how can they, would it be a secondary airport mm. or would they try to move everything, right? And you can, you can, if they don't, I feel like this is a Dulles to DCA or LaGuardia to JFK problem. If they don't put some hard limits on operations at Harry Reid down now, mm-hmm. no one's going to go to the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Like no one's going to walk. Why would I fly to the airport a half hour away? And I mean, it's just what I-15 needs, right? It's more traffic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and certainly they're not going to have mass transit, like good rail transit that avoids the traffic. So, you know. I'm great. trying to figure out where they would actually do it. Do you think they would like buy up like the dry lake beds or something like down there the, at the city of Jean? Because there's like a, there's like a sky skydiving place down off 15 when you're coming in. I don't know. Also, um, this this story is from June. I don't know why I first put it in the notes today, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I guess there's there's a lot of potential because it's pretty flat. I mean, there's mountains everywhere, but there's it's pretty flat when you're not near the hills. So, I guess it's easy to build an airport. Yeah, Southern Nevada Supplemental Airport is currently the official name. Five thousand acres have been allocated. Uh, huh. Sounds like an Allegiant special. Yeah. <laughs> L- L.A. East is what they'll call it. <laughs> oh man oh, I, I, I couldn't help it <laughs> that uh they did the, the article does note that perhaps by if uh bright line west which is the high-speed rail actually gets up and running it might alleviate some of the congestion because perhaps people will take that instead of flying have they said where the the, the bright line is going to like end would it be somewhere in LA proper, or would it be? No, nah, their, their current design, and we, I don't put that in the notes, but they got $3 billion, $3.2 billion in federal funding hmm. okay. uh, to help with their $8 billion construction costs. So it's actually moving oh. forward a little bit. That was our, yeah, there was a whole lot of rail money was released and announced on Friday last week. I did see that, yeah. And so that, that, yeah, I'm getting... that was one of the projects. But yeah, it's going to be super interesting. It, the original design had it stopping outside LA proper. Like Victorville, and then there, yeah, and there's a separate project to sort of connect it onward, which I think you're going to start to run into a problem of once people get in a car to start driving, mm-hmm. convincing them to stop driving to switch modes is challenging. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I mean, that's the challenge of LA, really. Yeah, and I don't, I'm not. I'm also not sure where on the Vegas end they're going to put the station, but I guess. I mean, if it went to Central Vegas, if it went to you know onto the Strip, I mean, it probably won't. But if it did, that would be. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, where do you, where are they going to buy land on the strip that works? But. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you did something even by the airport, yeah, I think mean, that's that's doable for most people, and they would be okay with it, like taking a Uber or Lyft that last mile. Shit. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, let's see what else we got here. Seattle Taipei Delta is launching this route next summer because the dartboard wasn't, uh, you know, like. Taipei's got generating some traffic these days. Yeah, they're covering nicely. Yeah, I, I don't, I just, I don't disagree. Okay, but for Delta, I mean, they, and Delta, to be fair, used to operate Tokyo Narita to Taipei as part of their service, and then I think even before that, as part of Northwest service out of Portland, they did like uh, Portland to Tokyo to Taipei to Bangkok or something. It's via Seoul, in fact. Oh, uh, yeah, Seoul. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, that was it. I, uh, thanks, Ned, for posting that old map in his flashbacks on Twitter. That was a great one. Um, yeah. yeah, like I, I got no problem with this route. It, what was interesting to me looking at it was, I mean, you know, we've talked about Delta's hub at uh, Seattle a bit, and I think there's been talk about how, whether well, you know, how it's definitely the least profitable of all the hubs and the challenges they're having growing it and making it reliable, etc. And this is clearly a hub operation for them. You know, nonstop is what it is and they'll pull some traffic, but I ran a quick query on Sirium of just like, you know, markets that have a three hour, one to three hour connection mm-hmm. in both directions. I think I did 90 minutes to three hours going out, uh, it, you know, from international to domestic to 
give a little bit of cushion. I don't know what the minimum connect times at Seattle are, but I made them up in my head. And, you know, even a, there's even a J- JFK Seattle flight that'll connect to it. Oh, well, okay. But like beyond that, just a ton of shorter haul stuff, local around the region, around, you know, the Western United States. Where I, I think I have the map here somewhere. Um, there we go. You know, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Redmond, Portland, Spokane, Boise, Salt Lake City, Austin, Kansas City, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, Nashville. There's a lot of routes that connect nicely there. Yeah. Denver's One Direction. Lewiston? LWS? I don't even know. Yeah, L. Lewiston. Good, so, old, good old Washington. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there, there's some interesting opportunities there for connecting flow. I thought was really interesting. That's Idaho. Sorry. That's Idaho. Lewiston. It's on the border. I always forget which one's which. It's Clarkston in Washington. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, I get your point. Like you're saying, it's it it makes a lot of sense from a connectivity standpoint for them. Um, yeah. And I I agree. I think the timing is attractive. Um, like it it's one of the flights to Taipei that that actually lands at like a decent hour. It's like five o'clock in the afternoon rather than two in the morning. And, yeah, two in the morning or midnight. Um. And so it's nice. I mean, United's flight out of San Francisco, they have two flights, but the one that's like leaves during the afternoon lands at you know, five thirty six o'clock. So I think that from that perspective, it's nice. It's weird to me because they're going to be competing with Starlux and Eva. Eva. Does Starlux have a Seattle flight yet or they're going to yeah, add it? It's going to start. Yeah. Okay. Starting up soon. Yeah. So that was, that was one of our listeners um, brought up should Delta try to get onward connectivity on China, on a side. You know, yeah. And the options are Eva or... Starlux, and so that's going to be a no and a no. No, but China Airlines. What? The, the, the Sky Team. All right, I forgot about them. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, that'll definitely work. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's what I was thinking, was that they were like trying to exploit that, or not exploit it, but utilize that feed um, on the China Airlines side. I haven't looked at connectivity to yeah. you know, I mean, what kind of stuff does well, China I mean, Airlines yeah. do at night. If you want to fly from Seattle to Ontario, California, you can <laughs> do that via Type A, thanks to the China Airlines Ontario flight, right? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like something you would do. Nah, flight. <laughs> that would be cabotage. It wouldn't be legal. Uh, yeah. Among, and it would be stupid. But, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's an interest. I mean, I will be interested to see if they actually sell, if they kind of get any kind of joint venture type stuff going and sell onward connections from Taipei on um, China Airlines. Um I have a feeling that they won't. I just I feel like that partnership's not super strong. I don't know. Yeah, they, it's definitely not a uh, joint venture, and I don't know if the U.S. has open skies with with how long to allow for that. Yep. Now Delta could have really come in hard on this and been like, "Yeah, we're flying to the domestic airport or the the close in airport." TSA. Yeah. Is the uh, I had a code for that airport. Yeah, I don't think so. No. No, I Why not? they allow it. I don't know. I'm just thinking like Delta could have been like, well, you won't let us fly into Haneda. So we're building a little hub at TSA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Wishful. Uh, Might have made me switch carriers. So uh, for, for all your travel to to Taipei. Yeah. Taipei. Yeah. I guess it's actually the runway is not long. It's only 8,500 feet there. Oh, yeah. And versus 12,000 up at uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, the old Chiang Kai-shek. Taiwan, Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. Taoyang. I don't speak Mandarin, so. Me neither. <laughs> um, San Francisco, Barcelona on United, because yeah, level, made, like level, made this work so well. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, you know, summer seasonal, pick up the on the edges, pick up some premium traffic, and hope for the best. Yeah. I, I guess. <laughs> Pull a seven seven two onto that route away from somewhere that you know is might not be as well, as well performing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fair. I, I, Barcelona seems like a stretch, but maybe it just does it during the summer. They just got the data to say, look, we can connect these people through, you know, Chicago or Newark or Dulles. And it's just easier to, for us to not do that. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not too surprised by this one again, because it's only summer seasonal. Yeah. That's a market that I think gets a pretty good, uh, sees pretty strong demand for the season. Well, and from a from a let's just talk theory, right? Perspective. If I'm connecting those passengers, right? If I can sell at a slight premium, then nonstop, 
um, and, or feed, you know, West Coast traffic into this flight. Yeah. Um, and I'm preventing those people from getting on flights to say Chicago or New York or whatever does. I mean, that opens up me, it opens up the possibility for me to sell more seats on those d- domestic flights. You get more seats on the domestic and you get more connecting on the other markets. Yeah. Internationally, right. So, you know, maybe Edinburgh, which doesn't have a San Francisco flight, but it does have Chicago and I'm making mm-hmm. that up. I think it did seasonally. Um, Maybe you get a few more passengers that are able to get into Chicago to get there, and um, there's enough nonstop traffic for Barcelona that it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they connect some people, quote unquote, backwards. Um, but a few people, you know, Denver could go backtrack to San Francisco rather than going east or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not too bad of a connection. It could give you, you could leave mid morning or I guess later morning and still make the flight because I, I think the timing is it leaves San Francisco at like two or three in the afternoon, right? No, I didn't look, but sure. I think I think it leaves in the afternoon. It's I not, know it's like very late westbound. Yeah, because let me see. I'm gonna look right now. Yeah, it was like a five or six p.m. westbound flight that gets to um San Francisco at like eight p.m. There we go. Uh, five twenty-five p.m. departure from San Francisco arriving two p.m. Westbound oh. is five twenty, arriving eight twenty five. That's later than I thought. Then I thought it was going to be like a two or three. Uh, uh, it's that's. I mean, you lo- you don't get a day in Barcelona on arrival, but you don't you go, can go straight to your hotel, so that's nice. Yep. yep. Um, and you get a full day before coming back. Which there are some people who don't like that. I'm married to one of them. Um, he would re- she would just rather come home. Travel day is a travel day, and so everything yeah. about it is the stress of getting to the travel. And yep. she does not enjoy sightseeing or trying to tag on one extra thing uh, the morning before in the morning before heading to the airport and coming home. Yeah, I get it. I get. It. I mean, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think to your point though, like for the Denver stuff, like you could go as far as Denver and do westbound, right, to make this flight, like it, like Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, um, Denver. You know, it, those folks could go west and make the flight pretty easily and have a full day before they they depart it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm certainly for the eastbound trip for the trip yeah, to yeah. Europe. Coming back, is Plus, there a 10 p.m. departure that's going to get them home the same night? Probably not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it won't. For that's me fair, maybe. But... For for like Portland, yeah. Yeah. But but for Denver, no, nah, not going to happen. So um like yeah, I'm looking it's a 9 p Oh, here to Barcelona is a 9 p.m. departure. So if you're leaving Denver, you probably have to leave a little earlier to catch the San Francisco flight. You think so? Yeah, because it leaves San Francisco at 5.25 p.m., which is really 7.25 p.m. in Chicago. So there's, I mean, I don't know how much longer that flight is, but there's a 90 minute. It leaves the United States 90 minutes earlier in absolute time. Oh, okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I got it. I didn't stock man. Uh, (laughs) But. They still might route some people, you know, you can do some of the asymmetric. You might get some people to do that uh, who want, the, honestly, I, I, if it was a choice for me, again, I would probably try to take that flight to have the longer sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where I could get and, it. And then, and then, yeah, land and you're good to go for a few hours and, you know, go land, eat food. Get to your hotel, take a shower, have to wait like three or four hours before you're going to have dinner. But, you know. What about, I mean, Barcelona being traffic wise do you think it's just a matter of them picking barcelona because there's there's more summer traffic over say madrid or <clears throat> it, i mean what's yes what, okay that's what i figured with like being yeah, no, it, the leisure demand into barcelona and the like holiday travel stuff both as a more appealing i think direct local tourism site also mm-hmm. cruise terminal I think there's some oh, yeah. in that they may benefit from. I'd have to check what that looks like for the summers. Um, and then, you know, personally speaking, like you're on the coast. So if you're in Madrid, it's like 110 degrees Yep. Uh, versus on the coast where it's only in the 90s. And there's a lot. It's just, you know, I mean, it's sort of like with picking Faro in the south of Portugal. They're, they're targeting some very much leisure markets for seasonal service. Yeah. 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 Makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. And it's a. It does. I mean, it's from May 23rd to October 25th. So pre, just before Memorial Day, 
is running late though. And I give, I respect that a little bit. That's, you know, going to get the late shoulder season there, not the early one. And yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so Delta's got some A330s stranded in Goose Bay. Are they opening up a hub? <laughs> you know, they got so excited by Continental 757 operation there. They're trying to one up them with the yeah. 30s. Bigger planes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, an Amsterdam Detroit flight had to divert. And then they sent a rescue plane. Mm-hmm. And the weather dropped. And the rescue plane, the pilots on the rescue plane couldn't. They ran out of uh, ran out of duty hours. And so then they had to send another rescue plane to rescue the rescue plane and get everybody home. How many days late? Uh, like two. And it was it was Detroit to Amsterdam? Amsterdam to Detroit. The West End. Okay, it was coming back. Okay. So. Yeah. The, the uh, hey, what, we're, we're recording this on Monday, so I think it happened on Sunday, and then the second one happened on Sunday, and finally by Monday they're getting out. I mean, that's, that's nuts. Yeah, they you know, sent them to the barracks to sleep and were able to provide food and beverage but not a great experience no no um i thought this was interesting Foz pointed this out to me and so we can talk a little bit about our theories here um newark and dulles to johannesburg have up to this point been uh 787-9s excuse me a second your throat man telling me here uh it's up to this point been a 787-9 uh, okay. They are going to switch to a 772 for both of those, Dulles and Newark to Johannesburg. Okay. Coming up in the, in the, in the new year, basically. Cool. Why? And where do the 787s go? Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of, it's strange. So the 772, if I remember correctly, is slightly more capacity, right? Uh, I think it's like 50 or 48, maybe of J seats or in coach. Maybe it's bigger. I don't know. I think it's bigger cool. in coach. I wonder if it also has um better cargo capacity at least eastbound i would imagine westbound either one is really pushing the limits yep so they're not bringing as much stuff back my, my, i'm gonna err on the side of cargo at this point I'm not getting any other information yeah because i'm looking it's 50 50 j seats 24 premium economy and 202 economy seats and then i'm gonna look at the 787 here um oh. 87-9. Come on. Where are you? Riveting content here. Yes. Good riveting. Um, it's hard to find them. Uh, there we go. 48 in business, 21 in premium economy, which is around the same, uh, and then 39 and 149, uh, economy plus, 39 in economy plus, and... So it's 190. It's only 12. It's 13 seats fewer, so it's roughly the same capacity. Yes, why? So it's, I, 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 I'm, that makes me think even more. It's a cargo thing, um, just cargo capacity. Yeah, is that what you think? It's. I mean, I, I'm just. I think I'm taken aback by the range part of it. I mean, it's that's a long flight. It's fifteen and a half hours, and with yeah. winds, it gets kind of weird, right? I, that's that was my remembering. I, maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, and Joe and Hennesburg operates as like hot and high, right? Yeah, so it's, I'm thinking it's probably eastbound cargo, not westbound. Okay. Yeah, it's 7,900 miles from Newark. Yeah. Um, this 777 has 420 cubic feet of cargo capacity, maybe? Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm reading random internet searches right. Um, and the... Yeah, the 787 is only like 70 cubic meters. Okay. So it's, right. no, 400, no, I'm reading something wrong, because this is also 420 cubic feet. Hmm. That must be a container, not the whole plane. Interesting. Um, yeah, I did not do my research. I apologize. No, it's okay. I just I think it's odd because, um, I mean, it's a long flight. It's it's really long, and they sell it out typically. When you look at the seat maps, it's pretty full every day that they yeah. operate. Um, so it just seems like a bit of a bit of a risk, maybe. Um, I guess westbound you can block seats if you need to. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm looking here. So Emirates says that they are seven 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 two hundred LR, which is similar. Mm-hmm. Holds ninety cubic meters and fifteen thousand kilos of cargo. Well, Amman Air says it's uh, 
787 is 14,000 kilos and 80 cubic meters. So it's 10 cubic meters and a thousand more kilos. That's yeah. Decent. Yeah. yeah it's a decent amount. Maybe just, maybe just enough. Hmm. Uh, or they came up with somewhere else where they think the 7879 is going to be a more efficient financially operating, you know, market, but I don't know. Well, so there's a question for you. Where, where do the 787-9s go? Like, you know, I, I don't think it's Asia. When's the change happen? January? February? Somewhere, yeah, yeah, January, February. Yeah. Okay. I and mean, I can try to find them, but I, I like I, to me, it makes sense. Maybe they, maybe they need something for India. Maybe they're starting to play around with the idea of flying a little deeper into India with the 787s. That's not going to happen without Russia overflight, I feel like. You don't think so? Because I thought I thought Newark could make it. Uh, they do Newark um, can. So you think they'd try to Newark Bangalore kind of thing, uh, or Newark Bombay, or which one the the, the one that they're not flying right now? Um, yeah, which I think is it's. I think it's. I think they're flying to Delhi. I don't think they're flying to Bombay. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So, and they could do it. It's seventy eight hundred miles. Um, I think it has to operate hot and high again there, just for summer stuff. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know here. I'm pulling up the report right now. So uh, between December of this year and March of next year, uh, what are we seeing with changes? Um, I got nothing filed where they're disappearing. San Francisco to Tahiti goes away. That's all That's I got. Inter- That's interesting. Or goes down or switch into something else. But it's... Huh. Do you think this is... I mean, let's throw this out and here. York Johannesburg. That's the other one that shows up on my list. <laughs> Go figure. Which, what is what is it? New York Johannesburg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Drop so, frequencies. Let's 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 throw this out there, right? There's been rumors of a high J config seven eighty seven. Yeah. Coming. Is this to accommodate that? They they gotta re they gotta re They'd have to do reconfiguration, so they need to pull them out of service. Pull them out of service. They they look they looked at what they need and they said we can do it with the seven seven two. Um and that gives us some slack in the 787 schedule. I'd be surprised if they were able to move that quickly to get the conversion happening mm. without having had this, the news leak or be announced. No, I got you. Okay. doesn't make it impossible, but yeah, it'd no. be surprising. Yeah. Okay, maybe not. So, yeah, just just an interesting tidbit that Foz sent me. I thought it was, we should talk about it. Yeah. Um, as far as, seven, it, well, United doesn't file... Their flights is seven seven two. That's weird. No, what are they filing as? Probably seven seven seven. Yeah, I just oh, I was, those, those are definitely are, different codes. Yeah, yeah, but those are definitely not interchangeable because they have some that can't go very far. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and some of the ones I'm seeing here are definitely uh, domestic operators. But like Newark Barcelona gets a seven triple seven picks up. Newark Frankfurt gets one in March that doesn't exist in December. China. Theoretically, it's coming back. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's talk about uh, cargo bits. You had some stuff you want to talk about. So two slightly interesting things going on in cargo in cargo land. Anyway, San Francisco, Hong Kong is dropped, switching from 772 to something else also. That's weird. What would it drop to? Yeah. 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 Um, my query is, doesn't give me the new. It just shows me what the old one was. Um Cafe Pacific Cargo has decided they currently operate 20 747 freighters, including, I think, 14 of the 8 series. Wow. Okay. They are going to buy six A350 freighters with 20 options. Wow. Yeah. So somewhat somewhat of an unexpected potential shift going on there. Um, Same time, like, Boeing's in a weird spot. They don't really have anything to sell these days. As far as cargo? I mean, yeah. I mean, they could are they can offer up a triple seven X cargo plane, but at this point, if you actually want some certainty of delivery of your aircraft, would you go for a triple seven X? I wouldn't. Like yeah. certification process, et cetera. We just don't. Know, you just don't know what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a really tough position for Boeing to be in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, th- there's rumors of a seven eight seven potential freighter. How that would work, you'd sort of need to have it come from Boeing rather than an aftermarket cutting a giant hole in the side of the carbon fiber fuselage situation, right? That's one of those works better on metal than carbon fiber stores. So um, there's that. And then 
What's the other cargo story I had? Um, it was a good one. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Serves me right for doing terrible notes. Um, yeah, I really had something else happening in the cargo world. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, come to you. Yeah, oh, yeah, I found it. Uh, Airbus operates its old Belugas. Yep. The A300 yep. model with the sort of whatever puffy head um, as a cargo operation now. They want to bring them to the United States starting in February. To do what? Uh, car- transatlantic cargo, basically. Oh, okay. And what where it gets interesting to me, and I don't know exact dimensions, but right now Antonov carries a lot of rockets, satellites, and engines around the United yep. States. As, and it's quote-unquote illegal. It's cabotage. So they have to prove that they're the only airline that's available to move these oversized things. And generally speaking, they are, and it generally is just fine. I'm wondering if air, if the Beluga has capacity for some of those parts, and as it comes across, it might start to poach some of that traffic away from Antonov. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, I get that. Um, in which case, you would start to potentially see domestic Beluga flights happening. Which would be kind of cool. Which would be kind of cool. It's a neat plane. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that is news. That's cool. So glad I found that. Yeah. 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 Um, and then lastly, um, the fake engine parts. Uh, this was Rolls Royce, right? No, no, this is the GE. Uh, GE, yeah. Whatever, Leap and not Leaps, but uh, CFMs. They were there was fake parts floating around, and there was a bunch of inspections having to take place because of these fake parts and failures, and yada yada yada. And uh, the person who was selling the fake parts has been arrested. A person of interest has been apprehended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's interesting. Obviously, that you know, too little, too late. And what are they going to get from him? But a uh, list of all the planes where the parts are installed. Unfortunately, I think it basically became a problem of they sold on word to random other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy, though. It's still crazy. It's a crazy story. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, anything else you want to chat about? No, no, nothing else. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing you guys talked a lot about uh, Hawaiian and Alaska last week. We did. Um, so you know, it had just come. The news had just come out when we started recording, so we're still working through. Um, the details, the joint, or not the joint, but keeping both brands remains confusing to me. Everybody who says, oh, well, you know, you wouldn't fly Alaska Airlines out of Asia, so they have to keep the Hawaiian brand. And to that I say, yeah, I, don't I think that's a silly theory. Like, no one actually cares what the airline is called when picking the destination it goes to. Yeah. I, I think... I'm I'm kind of of the mindset. I do think it's like a sub brand that Hawaiian's going to be, like it's going to be, if you're flying from the mainland to Hawaii or from Asia to Hawaii, I I think you're going to fly Hawaiian. That's kind of I think that's the way. You think we could start to see all of, and it's not that many, but all of Alaska's 737s that do island routes become Hawaiian. Yeah, I think so. Interesting. I so I've seen some people suggesting. International and inter island. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, does the route from Anchorage, the routes from Anchorage to Hawaii become Hawaiian because of what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. I, I'm just thinking from a cruise scheduling standpoint, right? Like, well, got... so on a scheduling standpoint, it's going to be a single union. I know, but that's why I point. Like, are you going to require all your crews to carry around two uniforms? I think there's going to have to be a common uniform. Like, it was... All I can think is someone posted like Moana, like a Moana <laughs> picture. It'll be the uniform is like Moana with, you know, hugging, you know, the, the, Chester. Oh, asking, yeah, Chester. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't know how they're going to do that. The, the, the flight attendant uniform was something I absolutely thought about because like, doesn't even Alaska, like for the flight attendants that fly on the island routes, like they wear lays, don't they? Some, I think do. Yeah. I think it depends. I, like I, I haven't. I knew that as one of them gave me one once, so. Yeah, I think they. I don't think they have to wear it, but I think they have one if they're yeah. operating a Hawaiian flight, um, like a Hawaiian a Hawaiian bound flight. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and to your point about how many destinations Alaska flies to, like they fly to a lot of places in Hawaii from a lot of places on the West Coast. Like yeah, Brandon, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, 
there's only five or six destinations in the islands. There's a lot of mainland destinations. Yeah, 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 exactly. But they fly to like Lahui from everywhere, and they fly to you know, you know Oahu from everywhere, and then I think that's like Kona maybe has most of the de- same places they fly. You know, it's it's a lot. Um, I yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah, that, that's so it's, one, that's gonna be one to how see how they play that. Yeah, because like I don't think like from Portland to Maui, right? Like Portland Maui has an A three twenty one from Hawaiian and a seven three nine. Ma- or seven three max, you know max seven thirty seven, to from on Alaskan. I I don't I don't think I don't think you can bring those together and put an A three thirty on that. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, yeah, and even if you could, you probably would want to keep a tiny bit of time of day differential and have like an early morning one that goes that picks up local traffic, and then a later morning one mm-hmm. that picks up connections. Maybe that early morning one you can actually offer some connections onward from Lahui, which I know. Typically, like you just route connections through Honolulu, but you could, they do have inter island service, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, all those things. I mean, I mean, I think it's like raises the question. Like, I come back to it. I, I've been thinking about this for a week now. Um, I, I get why they're doing it. I understand. Like, Hawaiian is struggling. Um, Alaska sees an opportunity to be a big carrier um, and potentially offer international service. I see them moving some of that stuff, though to Europe potentially because I think, I think Asia is still weak. And I think that's why, I think that's why Hawaiian struggles. Like I think Japan, the Japan market, while it's stronger, I don't think it's back to where it was pre COVID. Correct. And I don't, I think the people at Alaska are smart enough. I think the the leadership is smart enough to say, okay, we got to do something a little different. And maybe that is, we offer a one-stop service via Seattle to, to Hawaii on an A330 or something. And, yeah. and, that, and that's what we do from from Europe, you know, London or Amsterdam or whatever. Um, and they kind of they kind of kick kick at the door of Delta a little bit. Right. They Delta struggling at Seattle is, you know, I don't know. That's my thought. I just I feel like there's, there's something else going on. I think, you know what I mean? It, it, I don't know how to put it into words, but it's what I've been thinking about. I think they have to do something slightly different because I don't think they can rely on Asia alone. For, for what they're doing. And maybe it's they offer a Taipei flight. You know, they got this Starlux um, partnership. Um, yeah, they won't if they start flying to Taipei. Well, true. But but what if they what if they offer onward connections or what if they say, okay, Starlux, we'll invite you to Honolulu and we'll do onward connections if you want to, you know, to the inner island service. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Starlux, I could see them doing that. Um, and then H- Hawaiian's getting a bunch of 787s. Uh, I... And they have a bunch of A321s. I could see them going, some of them going domestic and then becoming Alaska, becoming a carrier, kind of like JetBlue, where, yeah, we've got a mid-range product on all of our routes, except for these like high tier, what we consider high tier routes, JFK to LA, San Francisco, maybe Boston to LA, San Francisco, um, maybe Orlando to San Francisco or something, like one of those Florida routes, Miami or something, where you're offering like live flat seats and you can charge a premium for it. I could, I could see that. I don't know. Man. Alaska doesn't like premium on the mainland. I know, I know, but I feel like I feel like they've got to do something. Like that's my, yeah. that's my, you know. Anyway, all right, that's it for that's it's for Stephen's uh, terrible market analysis. So, um, yeah, to our Patreon subscribers, stick around. We're going to talk about Hyatt, uh, Cancun, um, and something about Japan. We'll, we'll follow up with Seth. And uh, yeah, if you're not a Patreon subscriber, thanks for listening. We enjoy you being on. Uh, listening to the show and and leaving us messages on Twitter and and wherever else you would like to. And uh, we'll talk to you in the next one. Happy travels. Take care.